I just want to kind of bookend this thing a little bit and be like, and we know this, the first federal prosecutor decided not to, or de declined prosecution, tr commercial trainers told that. The first DA, uh, Manhattan DA, didn't prosecute, and then Alvin Bragg actually, I mean, campaigned on prosecuting it. And at the core, this is a false business record entries were used to cover up a conspiracy to promote an election by unlawful means. So the filing of false records is a misdemeanor, two-year statute of limitations. The New York conspiracy is a misdemeanor, two-year statute of limitations. By combining those two, you get to where you can actually create the felony with, a, with statute of limitations. Outside of anything else and talking about political, not political, this is an unbelievably aggressive use of prosecutorial discretion. So the charge of offense is the falsifying business records. The predicate, the predicate offense is the New York concealing a conspiracy to interfere. But here's where my question comes in, and this is, I've actually read all the jury selections. The unlawful means is where we get this, this grab bag, right, Ms. Mrs. Foley? Yes, that's where we get three possibilities instructed by And it's a in basic pick. But it, I went through the jury instructions, and here's my question. What elements of any of those predicate crimes are un, unlawful means? I mean, conspiracy in and of itself is, I mean, so if you charge a second offense driving under the influence, usually the sentence for a second offense is different than a first offense. In order to get to the second offense, you have to prove the first offense beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. Now, in those types of cases, it's a certified record of a court judgment. You just put it in the record. Uh, I've objected to just about everything that's ever put, been put into court when I was doing this. It's impossible to object to that. So when we're talking about these unlawful offenses and these three picture things and dealing with the New York misdemeanor statute that when you combine with the other misdemeanor statute, you end up getting to this felony and past the two-year statute of limitations. But was the jury required to prove any of those underlying elements beyond a reasonable doubt to any of those crimes? Because I'm talking about the Fifth Amendment and the due process part of that. No, and in fact, you know, based on the instructions, we don't even know which of those possible three areas of law the jury yeah, decided it. because they didn't have to be unanimous. But it's really more than three laws, too, by the way, because the tax laws that he instructed the jury on could include local, state, and federal tax laws. Um, and by the way, the, the mention of local or federal tax laws had never been made at all before. At most, right, the, um, the prosecution had mentioned the possibility of um, uh, state tax laws as being the first predicate, not the second. Yeah, and I'm actually into the third layer of this because unlawful means, I mean, I, I'm just thinking of, I've never defended a case in New York. I just never practiced in New York, but I have defended cases in state court and I've defended cases in federal court. And I'm thinking about arguing against a case when you, I mean, I made my living on if there were seven elements of a crime, mm -hmm. winning one of them. <laughs> like, I don't need to win all seven. I gotta get proof beyond a reasonable doubt on one of the seven elements. And they're not laid out anywhere in this whole process, are they? No, I mean, that's the problem. You don't know how the jury got to where they got at the end. In fact, you didn't even know how they could get there until the, they were instructed. And then once they were instructed, because they could, you know, kind of pick and choose which of the unlawful means they wanted to, to base the New York election law violation on, you, you have absolutely no idea what, why President Trump was guilty of a felony based upon theories of two different misdemeanors. So, <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I was busy and doing all of these things, and I tend to not listen to the cable news rhetoric and, and all of these different things because I've actually been in there, and I think they get it wrong a lot. Yeah. But I get through it, and I read it, and I'm like just thinking, how do you possibly do this? And that's where I'm frustrated, and I'm frustrated with the rhetoric like today, too, because like I've been criminal of the administration of justice since 2003 when I got sworn into the North Dakota bar. <laughs> I mean, I've introduced bills on exculpatory evidence, recording interrogations, crack parity and sentencing, acquitted conduct, all of these things, oftentimes working with the other side of the aisle. But the nearest I can think of, and I agree with you, and I appreciate you saying it earlier, the jury's only as good as the instructions they get. I do not criticize the jury. I get a little frustrated. I mean, I, political demographics and all of that, I mean, I've dealt with that. I don't criticize the jury. But nearest I can figure out Anybody who criticizes Judge Mershon or Judge Bragg 
is like mm-hmm. okay. mm-hmm. DA Bragg is like causing our criminal justice system to come crumbling down and democracy at itself is going to fail. With Judge Cannon, Judge Alito, and Judge Thomas completely on limits, you can do that whenever you want. So I think what it really means is if you don't agree with me, you're a danger to democracy. If you agree with me, you're perfectly acceptable. And with that, I yield.